So we've been talking about this idea that identity can be an important part of understanding conflict in the international system. And I don't think that we can, can fairly finish that conversation without first introducing and talking about this idea of clash of civilizations. So Clash of Civilizations is an argument that was put forward by Sam Huntington in the early 1990s as a way of sort of throwing cold water on the euphoria, uh, euphoria after the Cold War that said, look, communism is gone, there's no more problems, everything will be fine moving forward. And Huntington said, yeah, okay, well, so the, for the 20th century, there was an ideological battle between capitalism and communism. But now that that's done, um, what's going to happen is we're going to see these new cultural blocks, these civilizations emerging, and the conflicts of the future are going to be between civilizations over cultural issues that didn't matter during the Cold War. Now, there are lots and lots of problems with this theory, and social scientists have spent a decade and a half, closing in on two and a half decades, tearing this thing apart. Um, for example, what is a civilization? Well, if we go through Huntington's book on this and try and figure out roughly what he means by this, he divides the world up into seven or eight or nine different civilizations, depending on how you want to count. There's Western Christendom, which is sort of Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. There's the Orthodox world, which is basically sort of the Soviet Union and a good chunk of the Eastern European um, uh, world. Um, there's Latin America, which is most of everything south of the Rio Grande. Uh, there's Hindu civilization, which is basically India and Nepal. There's um, Sinic civilization, China, Korea. Japan gets to be its own civilization standing alone. Um, there's a Buddhist civilization, which is kind of the dark blue. There's sub-Saharan African civilization, which is a, kind of a hodgepodge of Eastern, Central, and Southern um, Africa. Uh, and then there's Islamic civilization, which is really a hodgepodge and includes Sunnis and Shias, um, includes folks in sort of the Middle East with an Arab sort of ethnic um, history in Central Asia and Southeast Asia and North Africa and even into, um, you know, the, the more black African parts of, of the continent. Um, it's a huge mix of very different groups with, with very different cultures. But Huntington, as he tends to do with the classical civilization theory, just sort of paints with a broad brush and says, nope, we're, we're gonna make all this yellow and call it Islamic civilization. And that ends up being really problematic as we'll see when we talk about how the theory is supposed to operate. So we've got this problem, what is a civilization? And some of these sort of broad brush um, paintings of civilizations are, are really overly simplistic to the point of being maybe even ridiculous. But I've made a big point throughout this class of, of not judging theories on whether or not they're true or false, right? Whether or not these civilizations exist, whether they look exactly like Huntington's um, maps, we judge theories based on whether they're useful or not useful. So let's spend some time talking about how the theory is supposed to operate and then we can talk about whether or not it's actually working the way it's supposed to. So Huntington lays out his theory and says, it's a process of, of essentially four, four elements, right? So the first thing that's happening is that globalization, trade and communication are bringing the world together, right? And civilizations that in the past are able to grow up over the course of millennia and sort of do things on their own are now engaged in regular interactions and maybe even are responding to a common global culture which has a very much Western civilizational flair to it. Um, secondly, Huntington says that civilizations at a very basic level do not understand each other. Right? because they have fundamentally different worldviews about how reality operates. Differences of, of understanding in terms of the individual, the, the role of the individual versus society, um, the, the role of the individual and, and obligations to family, the relationship between the individual and the divine, or the relationship between men and women. These things are, are, are mis, uh, not misunderstood, but these things are, are, are different on, on very fundamental levels, and we don't always understand where folks from different civilizations are coming from. We don't understand the symbols, we don't understand the narratives, we don't understand how they view the world. And as a result, um, we end up bumping into each other, right? States are gonna clash because of these, these fundamental misunderstandings, different ways of viewing the world, and because they're bumping into each other because of globalization, right? Now, up until this point, the story is 
people who view the world differently and are forced to interact are occasionally going to get on each other's nerves. Now, if you, we stop things right there, um, I don't think anybody would disagree with that story. But we also wouldn't have clash of civilizations. We would just have you put people together in a small room with different views and, and understandings of the world, and they know each other. That's not clash of civilizations. Clash of civilizations is this next step. Huntington says that when you get these conflicts between um, civilizations, when there's an annoyance or there's an irritation, that what's gonna end up happening is that everybody lines up behind their side in that civilization. And what starts out as a localized conflict quickly turns into the galvanizing of civilizations into blocks, and it's now a clashing of blocks as a whole, rather than just two countries or two individuals that were initially in this conflict, right? Everyone's taking sides, and they're taking sides based upon civilization. So at a very fundamental level, does this actually happen? Is this playing out? And certainly there are anecdotes where we could point to it that look like, yeah, this, this really makes sense, right? And so you could tell a story about September 11th and the whole Al-Qaeda thing as a clash of civilizations, right? That Al-Qaeda has a different vision of the world than the Western vision and they respond with violence. And that seems to fit really well with the clash of civilizations on the surface. But as soon as you dig down to it, we find that we're not getting step four quite the way that we expected, right? So after Al-Qaeda launches its attack on the United States in 2001, there is a galvanizing in the West, right? The United States activates the NATO alliance, the Western alliance, and it goes to war in Afghanistan. But there's not a galvanization of the Islamic world. In fact, no country in the entire Islamic world comes to Al-Qaeda's aid, comes to help the Taliban, and many hang them out to dry. Pakistan assists and helps with the logistics and, and providing access to Afghanistan for the US to topple the Taliban. Um, in Tehran, the capital of Iran, there are a million people who take to the streets protesting against Al Qaeda and in favor of the United States. That's not the galvanization that Huntington is anticipating in clash civilizations. We could go forward just a couple more years to 2003 when the United States is pushing to invade Iraq. And again, no one comes to the aid of Iraq. The closest we get is Turkey saying, please don't use Turkey to invade northern Iraq. We would not like that. Um, Kuwait, on the other hand, says, oh, you can use our territory as a staging area. That would be awesome. Get them. They're to the north. So we're not seeing that solidarity within the Islamic world, but we're also not seeing solidarity within the Western alliance system, right? The United States and Britain are sort of gung-ho on invading Iraq in 2003, but France and Germany do everything they possibly can to stop the United States from launching that invasion, um, from legitimizing that invasion. And it's a real rift within the Western alliance community. So we're not seeing, even just anecdotally, that things are playing out the way Huntington anticipates. But I'll go a step further. When we run the numbers statistically, what we find is that states are just as likely to fight wars within their civilizations as between civilizations. And if you think about that, that actually kind of makes sense. Um, you could look um, into the line between the Islamic world and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and there's a, a conflict there in, in Sudan that on the surface looks a lot like what Huntington would anticipate, right? You've got sort of an Arab Muslim regime in the north, in, in Khartoum of, of, of Sudan, and then in the south of Sudan, you've got sort of a, a, a black African, maybe Christian, maybe animist, um, different uh, culture and different, different uh, civilizational framework. And they end up fighting a civil war for decades and finally carve the country in two and create Sudan, uh, Sudan and South Sudan. So you could tell a story about clash civilization that actually works. But it turns out that there's a second civil war that goes on in Sudan, and that's between not north and south, but east and west. It turns out that the population in the western part of um, Sudan, in the Darfur region, would really like to not be ruled over by Khartoum as well, and launch a, an uprising and try to break free, and it's brutally crushed, and there's peacekeepers in there now, because it turns out that it's not just about civilization, it's that nobody really wants to be ruled by Khartoum um, in Sudan, and so just as likely to happen within a civilizational block as between civilizations which suggests that civilizations aren't actually doing a whole lot to explain why we get conflicts between countries. So 